Born in Ohio in 1837, Harrison Gray Otis was destined to become the owner and publisher of the Los Angeles Times and a powerful force for change in California. As a young man, he worked as a printer's apprentice and in 1859 was married to poet and teacher Eliza Weatherby of New England. As the Civil War approached, Eliza wrote in her journal about her desire to do something, but it was her husband who acted while she was left at home. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, Harrison joined the 12th Regiment of Ohio Volunteers as a private. Over his 49 months of service, he fought in 15 battles, including Bull Run and Antietam, where he was wounded. He was promoted many times for gallant and meritorious service, and when he was finally mustered out, he had risen to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Eliza's journal tells us how they were changed over the years by the grisly realities of war and the death of their first child. They became tougher and even more devoted to a sense of mission. In 1876, they moved to California. After many struggles, business failures, and poor health, Harrison and Eliza took one last desperate gamble and bought a share of a failing newspaper. The Los Angeles Times published its first edition in 1881 under the name of the Los Angeles Daily Times. The newspaper's original founder soon ran out of money, and the fledgling paper was inherited by its printer, the Mirror Printing Office and Book Bindery. The Mirror Company needed an editor who could help it recoup its losses. They found their man in former military officer Harrison Gray Otis. General Otis believed in the future of Los Angeles, and he invested in the paper and turned it into a financial success, purchasing the entire Times and Mirror properties in 1884 and creating the Times Mirror Company. As Los Angeles grew, so did the Times. General Otis had a great vision for the future of Los Angeles. He was determined to use his newspaper to help turn the young city into the grandest and most flourishing metropolis in the West. Harrison Gross was responsible for the development and the growth of not just the Los Angeles Times, but for the growth and the development of Southern California generally. All these pieces came in, into play for Harrison Griotis and the development of the Los Angeles Times, and he became many things to many different people in Southern California through the role that he and his newspaper played uh, in the growth and the development of the region. One of the reasons he was successful was that he was very visible and he was, he was a very flamboyant fellow. He had a non-functioning cannon mounted on the a hood of his car. Uh, he'd drive through the streets of Southern California and Los Angeles and people would start visibly. Uh, sometimes they'd break into a run when they saw this car approaching. Uh, he wasn't a shy, retiring kind of fellow who, who, who ran a newspaper and, and worked the, me the mechanisms of power that way from behind the scenes. As businessmen and people often did, they were often hidden away, secluded. Um, but he was out there, he was visible, he, he was a, a, an outsized personality, and that outsized personality really contributed to the way that the newspaper uh, came to be known in Southern California. His larger-than-life personality was one of the ways he was able to affect change in Southern California. His military style and bearing were imposing. He was proud of his service and his rank and used it. So when the Spanish-American War broke out, Otis again volunteered. It was in his early 60s when he was made Brigadier General and assigned to the Philippines under General MacArthur. For his conduct in the war, Otis was made a Major General in 1899. Shortly after his return, Eliza became ill and died. The General's focus turned to his business. When Harrison Gray Otis returned to work for the Los Angeles Times after the Spanish-American War, he was instrumental in the city's development. And he was part of something called the San Fernando Syndicate, which was a group of investors who bought land in the San Fernando Valley, based on the inside knowledge that the, that the Los Angeles aqueduct would soon irrigate it. So Otis used the Times to do different things related to the water, like frightening the citizens with news stories of a drought to vote for a bond issue that would fund an aqueduct. And he really got the populace to get behind uh, this aqueduct's construction. And the movie Chinatown is really a loosely veiled portrait in some ways uh, of Harrison Gray Otis and the Times and their role in land and water and power in Southern California. When he first came out here, he figured if you dumped water into the desert sand and let it percolate down to the bedrock, it'd stay there instead of evaporate the way it does in most reservoirs. You only lose 20% instead of 70 or 80. He made this city. And that's what you were going to do in the valley? It's what I am doing. If the bond issue passes Tuesday, there'll be $8 million to build an aqueduct and a reservoir. I'm doing it. 
going to be a lot of irate citizens when they find out that they're paying for water that they're not going to get. Oh, that's all taken care of. See, Mr. Gibbs, either you bring the water to L.A. or you bring L.A. to the water. How are you going to do that? By incorporating the valley into the city. Simple as that. How much are you worth? I have no idea. How much do you want? No, I just want to know what you're worth. Over 10 million? Oh, my, yes. Why are you doing it? How much better can you eat? What can you buy that you can't already afford? The future, Mr. Gitz. The future. And there's no doubt that the movie was a thinly veiled stand-in for Harrison Gray Otis. The triad for Harrison Gray Otis was land, water, and communication. So he was kind of like the Henry, uh, like the Huntington Library's Henry Huntington. He owned a great deal of land in Southern California and Mexico, and he really put a stamp on the way that those regions were developed and used. He was at least partially responsible for the Owens Valley water coming to Southern California. He knew that water was a key component for Southern California, and if he could get Northern California water here, he could expand Los Angeles. But, but population growth in the Southern California desert was a hard sell without the water. Otis wanted Southern California to grow, and he had the newspaper to help make that happen. He popularized Southern California to people in other colder parts of the country. He published a midwinter edition for many years. It was a free publication distributed around the country and in color, one of the first. The newspaper came up with a number of different vehicles to promote the growth of the region. So the midwinter uh, edition of the newspaper was published uh, starting early in the century and it would show images of snow covered uh, mountains in the background and beautiful images in the foreground of, of orange groves with luscious ripe fruit, uh, an irresistible image to, to Easterners who uh, had to uh, who really often were desperate to get away from bad weather to somewhere a little more idyllic. And it was clever that he published it in the dead of winter. Uh, Midwinter in, in the East Coast looks like this, but here in Southern California, gosh, look at the glories uh, available. Um, if you'll just come out here and, and try, uh, try a life in Southern California. In 1891, General Otis and the Times pushed for the development of San Pedro Harbor. The decade-long fight was against the Southern Pacific Railroad, who wanted to develop Santa Monica. The plan was to build a breakwater and harbor for shipping and trade to help Southern California grow. The general again was successful, and today the Port of Los Angeles is the busiest in the United States. In 1890, the Times took a stand against organized labor. Otis refused to compromise with the unions over a wage cut, and it resulted in a boycott and strike. Otis even worked in the press room himself during the strike. Hostility built over the years, and during another citywide strike on October the 1st, 1910, the Times building was destroyed by a bomb, killing 20 and injuring 17. Otis and the Times blamed union supporters polarizing the city. When the Times was bombed in 1910, it really put a pall over Southern California, and because all the labor activists had been blamed for uh, the, for the bombing, and it really painted uh, the whole labor movement with the same uh, with the same brush. And uh, you compare it to other cities in the Midwest, like Chicago, and where labor had a much stronger toehold or foothold, um, you know, the, the 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 influence and power and scope of labor in Southern California was greatly diminished for decades because of the bombing and all they did in terms of public perception of labor. Otis was a staunch Republican, he was a supporter of Lincoln uh, and, and several other Republican presidents. There's a famous photo of him sitting talking to uh, Taft in an open car, they're sort of leaning in to talk to each other, clearly confidants and friends. Uh, he was involved in national politics and extremely curious about them. And Harris Gray Otis's reach extends into this family dynasty that really uh, lasts for a long time. Since its first four-page edition slid off the press in 1881, the Los Angeles Times has grown and flourished as much as the city it calls home. Today, the Times is the largest metropolitan daily newspaper in the country, with dozens of foreign and domestic news bureaus and one of the largest editorial staffs in the country. General Harrison Gray Otis died at the age of 80 on July 30, 1917. He left his company at, in the hands of his son-in-law, Harry Chandler. But more importantly, he left his mark on the future of Southern California, Los Angeles, and his beloved newspaper, the Los Angeles Times. <laughs>